Uh, we're going to talk about ways that you can optimize your existing open social app in the context of a high traffic application. Uh, if you have any questions during the session, we'll take uh, questions afterwards if we have a little bit of extra time. Uh, there's a link here to go to Google Moderator where you can add a question, and uh, if, we, if we can get to them, then we'll answer them. So to begin, let's talk about uh, what success means as a social application developer. Obviously, the more money you make, uh, the better you're doing. So uh, the trouble with this is that social ECPM uh, is basically like a, a, is very low compared to the rest of the uh, web type industries. Uh, it's actually the lowest of news, entertainment, technology, gaming. Um, so basically, for each uh, page render of your social application, uh, you're making less money than uh, other industries. The good thing about this, though, is that you have direct access to millions of signed-in users. Uh, usually, if your application is running inside of a social platform, uh, those users have a very low barrier to entry to install your application. And there's also growth functionality built into a lot of platforms. So you can share your app, invite your friends, et cetera. And so social applications see a lot of growth and a lot of very quick growth. So um, even though that the CPM is, is pretty low, you, you have growth to make up for it. Now, what this means in terms of performance, though, is that small tweaks really matter. And uh, let's look at a few quotes about how uh, small tweaks really do matter for large-scale applications. There's a quote from Rissa Meyer talking about how uh, when Google was deciding on how many results to return in their search index, they actually did experiments with different types of users to determine what was the optimal uh, number. And by increasing the number of results, they actually slowed down rendering time by about half a second. Now, the, the group that actually had the more, uh, more results uh, wound up dropping off their traffic by about 20%. That means about 20% fewer Google searches happened because the page was slow. So if half a second of latency makes that much difference, then you can see how important it is to a big site like Google. Here's a quote from Greg Linden at Amazon, uh, talking about how, uh, how Amazon also did experiments with latency to see how it, it would affect sales. Uh, when they increased the page load by 0.1 seconds, that's 100 milliseconds, it cost them 1% of their sales. There's like a direct correlation between latency and the amount of sales that Amazon was experiencing. Finally, a uh, last quote by Marissa is um, talking about how Google Maps, uh, after they first launched, uh, had a 100 kilobyte page load. Uh, now, they found a lot of adoption quickly, but then they decided that there was actually ways that they could optimize this size. And they actually trimmed about 30 kilobytes of JavaScript out of the initial download. Now, dropping the 30 kilobytes actually, uh, from that point on, uh, made Google Maps grow by 30% in three weeks. So there was actually, again, a direct correlation between page size and the amount of growth they experienced. So for this presentation, we're going to measure the impact of changes on large-scale applications. So the sort of applications that once you actually make it like reasonably large in the open social space, uh, these are the tweaks that will actually help you uh, lower your costs and then make your users uh, happier. To do this, we actually wrote a sample open social application, and we rewrote it like four times. And uh, what that was was that we, uh, each time we rewrote it, we uh, isolated different strategies to optimize the, the application, and then we did uh, metrics to count it and see what the, the net effect was. Uh, the idea is that we can show you um, we can show you ways that you can deliver a fast user experience. We can also minimize the costs, so reducing the amount of uh, server charges that you need to spend and then highlight uh, some new open social features that you might not be aware of that you can use in your apps today. Or, uh, yeah. So the app that we wrote was called uh, Quarter Mile. Uh, basically, it's a very, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, it's, I'm sorry. <laughs> there you go. Uh, here's, a, here's a live demo of uh, how the app works. I'm actually in Orkut right now, and I'm installing it into the UI, uh, accepting add application. You can see the, the interface is that it's a fitness application. And what it does is it, when you first load it, it asks you what team you'd like to be on. So here I'm just going to pick one of the teams that my friends are members of. And you can see there's actually team uh, data coming in uh, upon the load of the app. So on the middle uh, the column, you can see the graphs about what the fitness was. On the right, there's uh, individual fitness uh, activities. What I'm doing right now is I'm sending an invite to one of my friends just uh, to invite them to my team. So I joined a team, and then now I'm getting one of my friends to join me also. Now I'm going to start entering in some fitness data. So 
Here I'm just typing in in natural English, I walked one mile yesterday, and I'm posting this activity. And when I post it, the, the graphs update, and you can uh, see that there's now three people actively contributing to this team. On the right-hand side, there's actually a list of activities, and my activity is marked uh, with the number of foodles uh, that the activity is worth. So we kind of came up with some metrics on, uh, you know, running is worth X number of foodles if you do it for so long and whatever. And we kind of standardize all our exercises together. So in this case, uh, I'm typing in that I ran two miles two days ago. Uh, and you can see that the graph updates. Here I'm doing 1,000 sit-ups on May 23rd. And the graph updates also. So there's different types of exercises kind of standardized into one general data set. And this will kind of just show you, this is the sort of social application, you know, exercising with your friends that um, you would see in a, in a real ecosystem. I guess there's potential, or maybe to flatter myself, there's potential for it to grow pretty large. Uh, the back end uh, is built on Google App Engine. Uh, basically, we structured it so that the back end was called via JSON RPC calls, uh, transferring data back and forth from the front ends. The front ends were written in uh, many different ways. So actually, if you were at the previous session, uh, Google and the social web, you saw a few of those front ends running in different containers. Uh, the one that we wrote for this uh, was a little bit different because we kept the same functionality and we just rewrote it to see how we could optimize that. Uh, there's a few links here uh, on the slides. Uh, feel free to check them out later. The, all this stuff will be posted online. And uh, to measure it, we have uh, three different types of requests. Basically, uh, API requests to the back end, the App Engine back end. Uh, we have API requests to the open social APIs uh, on the container in which it runs. And then we have assets like JavaScript, uh, CSS, images, et cetera. And we're measuring on uh, four different metric points, uh, bandwidth per page view, so the total download size that the server is serving up every time the page is loaded, uh, the number of requests per page view, uh, that's just counting the number of individual HTTP requests, uh, the latency per page view, so the amount of time that it takes from the time that the app is loaded until it's ready to use, and then CPU time is actually a metric unique uh, to App Engine, uh, but uh, what it is is basically how, uh, a measure of how much back-end work we're doing. Uh, the reason we're, we're actually including this in the measurements um, is we can actually do a cost calculation on this later on. Uh, now, measuring each of these individually is important because you can actually sometimes tweak one while you're not affecting the others, and you have certain amounts of control uh, over certain requests, and you don't really over others. So being able to realize what you can optimize and what you can't optimize is important. So here are the raw numbers for the naive implementation. And what we did was we wrote this application as if you had just read the open social tutorial for the first time, uh, and you just started writing this app, and you kind of threw everything in there and got it together. Uh, you can see that uh, we broke it down again through API calls to the quarter mile backend, through social requests to open social, and then image and CSS and JavaScript. Uh, and then finally, the, the only uh, metric which actually has a server processing uh, metric is uh, API calls to the quarter mile backend, because the rest of it is pretty much free for our server. Now, uh, when you actually uh, look at the, the, raw, the first set of metrics that we, we counted was, uh, first of all, the latency of the gadget, and uh, we'll cover more about this later, but this is basically the gadget perceived latency uh, from the time that the head of the gadget renders to the time that it's first usable by the end user. Uh, it took us about 2.7 seconds. Uh, the next latency metric is the page latency. So if you were to just open up the iframe in which this gadget ran and then reload it and measure that speed, uh, that was about 3.5 seconds. Now, this is maybe a little bit more uh, accurate in terms of perceived latency just because it's the amount of time that the user sees, not what the gadget sees. Uh, so it includes the round trips to the, our backend server. Finally, uh, the number of requests. It took 26 HTTP requests to render the gadget for the first time, including images, CSS, uh, backend API calls, et cetera. And then we just ran it through YSlow, which we'll talk about more later. But uh, we got a, a not-so-great score of 72. Uh, finally, the cost of this app, uh, just doing some numbers, really thinking about, like, how can we put this in perspective to you as an app developer, is if you have a reasonable amount of traffic, and, and reasonable is actually fairly large by most web standards, but for a social application is not really um, that, that huge, is 11 QPS on average, uh, winds up being about a million page views a day, uh, 30 million over the course of a month. And when we actually did all that, then we found that the, the app consumes about uh, five terabytes of uh, bandwidth traffic uh, and 1,859 hours of CPUs. Um, now, 
the great thing about these two measurements is that App Engine actually has set costs for these. So uh, we can kind of estimate what it would cost uh, to add this amount of traffic onto our existing App Engine. Now, keep in mind that this isn't really a, a direct correlation of what you would pay to run this app on App Engine, because App Engine does have a free quota. Um, and this is really just saying, if you had a million extra page views a day, uh, you would be paying about $900 a month more for that amount of traffic. Uh, it's certainly reasonable for apps to scale that large. We have social apps going up to, you know, the hundreds of QPS. So uh, 11 isn't really, isn't really that strange. So when we're looking at how to gadgets, it's important to keep in mind that gadgets are actually web pages as well. They're a web page embedded in an iframe within a social profile. So any of the optimizations that we know to do to web pages count for gadgets as well. So some of the tricks that we'll be looking at is how to reduce the size of the page. How do we reduce the amount of requests that a page needs to make to actually make the gadget work and render and be displayed. And we'll be looking at the total latency that a gadget has associated with it before you can start interacting with it. To look at all these different numbers and to be able to investigate how your application is doing. There's a number of tools for pretty much every mainstream web browser. If you're using Safari, then the Web Inspector is the awesome tool to use. If you're using Firefox, then you've got Firebug and Wiselow to analyze your results. And in IE, you've got tools like HTTP Watch with which you can analyze what's happening. So one of the first big tricks that you have with web development to make your application slower is by concatenating all your JavaScript files into one big file and concatenating all your CSS files into one big file too. That way you only have to download one big file instead of making several requests to your backend server. Making a request to a server over HTTP is really slow because you're making a TCP RP connection, you're talking protocol with a server, so just by removing that from downloading the app, it already becomes a lot faster. So you're using a bit less bandwidth, your latency is going down and the amount of requests that you're making is going down. Then the next step is to compress those things. There's a number of tools for that, like JSMin, a UE compressor, etc. And you can use that to compress your JavaScript. What it will do is it will take your JavaScript, as you see here, and it will remove everything that's not syntactically required, so spaces, line breaks. It will even go so far sometimes as to rename variables to shorter names, just to save size. You can see the result as you're getting using those tools in your browsers, like here's a little example of what it would look like in Safari, and you see a total download size. So when we did this to Quartermile, we noticed that we saved up to 54% of the download size on the JavaScript and the stylesheet assets. So that's a huge reduction in the amount of bandwidth required, and you sped up your application by quite a bit as well, resulting in a saving, well, on this monthly amount, $61. So that's pretty damn good. The next thing you want to look at is latency. When you're developing your application, you'll be working on your own server, and you can use tools, again, like the Web Inspector and Firebug to see what the total loading time of your application is. And that's a great trick, and it's a great way to make sure that you're optimizing it as much as possible. But at some point, you get into the situation where your app is deployed on a social networking site, and there's going to be people using it, and they're not going to be in the same ISP as you. They're not going to be in the same country as you. They might be going through proxy servers, different network routes, etc. So how do you measure that, and how do you figure out where in the world your people are coming from and what their experience of the application is? So we know we need to measure this from different locations. We know we need to keep measuring it as well because situations change. Your application can suddenly become really popular or maybe you gain a lot of users in a country where you didn't expect you would get a lot of users and you might want to invest in a CDN or bringing a server closer to those users so they get a really fast experience too. So to be able to measure that, you can't use those standard tools anymore and you need to build something yourself, some custom code. And here's an example of how you would do this in JavaScript. For instance, for measuring the latency, you could create an image element, then you add an unload function to it, and that forces the web browser to actually always download that image. And then on the unload event, you measure, hey, I started at this time and I ended in this time, so I know what my network latency is now. This is great for defining the network latency. Then there's also the latency for how long does it take to make an API call to my own backend server. So you would put, put the same type of code around the data calls to your server as well. And you can combine those graphs saying, well, here I see that my network latency is really low, but the latency for making data calls is really high, so now I know that my servers are slowing down, and I need to invest in that to make sure that the latency keeps low and my users keep on being happy. 
The next trick that you can use from web development is image spriting. Image spriting is a technology where you take a number of images and you combine it into one big image file. And you use style sheets to position that as a background and an element to only show the bit of the image that you're interested in displaying in that part. The big benefit to doing this is that you reduce the amount of requests you're making to your server by quite a bit again. You only have to download one image file instead of having to download 10 or 20 of them. So the latency goes down, total request count goes down. And you can use tools like, well, YSlow is one of my favorites because it shows you both the situation when you have a completely clean browser that's never been to this page before, and it shows you when you've gone there before and you've got a primed cache, so everything that's cacheable is already in your cache. And it will show you a beautiful breakdown of the amount of requests you're making, what kind of a request count is going to what type of resource. So when we applied this image spriting technique to Quartermount, we noticed that latency went down by quite a bit, 45%. And that's a really good saving. However, we also noticed that the size was going up because there's always a little bit of white space in your big image. So the next thing we did is that we optimized the palette of the image file as well. So you're reducing the palette size means there's less bit stored. And we ended up actually saving quite a bit on the size of it as well. And we went from 15 image requests to just one, which is a big saving indeed. So the saving in the amount of dollars that you're doing here isn't that big. The biggest saving is probably that your application is going to be a lot faster, which means that you're going to ha get happier users that are coming back more often and using the application more often as well. The last thing that I want to cover in this bit about general web optimization is caching headers. It's one of the really nifty tricks that your web browser has seen this image before. It knows that it's still valid, it's local copy, so it doesn't even have to download. It doesn't have to connect to your server. It can just instantly display it without having to do any action. So it's the ultimate optimization trick. The downside is that not everybody's using this yet. So when you're using dynamic languages, you can use whatever language you're using to set a header with a cache control max age is some really high number into the future. To tell the web browser, hey, you can save this file, you don't have to re-download it every time. For static files, you can configure your web server to say, well, hey, whenever you find a file of this type, just append the caching header to it so that the browser will know it can cache that as well. And here's a little example of how you will configure that in Apache, where we tell it, well, anything that matches against a style sheet, a JavaScript, a GIF file, a JPEG, or a BNG, just append this cache control header to it, and you can cache it for about two years into the future. Now, one of the things that you might be worried about is, so if I change my CSS file, my JavaScript file, how do I tell the browser to download it again? That's what we're using cache busting techniques for, and that's basically appending like a version is some number after the query string, and the browser will know like, hey, this is a different URL, and download it again, and then cache it again for two years. But beyond normal web optimizations, what are the optimizations that you can do uh, because you're actually running on a social network? So things that the network servers are actually going to help you out with. Um, there's certainly a good uh, reason why they would want to help you out is because if you have a social gadget and a small tweak will make a significant impact on your revenue, uh, if you're a social network, you get the aggregate benefit of all of those tweaks. So if you can force some of them to happen, then... Uh, uh, Obviously, it's in their best interest even more so. Uh, some of the advantages that a social network has that you don't really have is that they can control what HTML they output. So even though you're writing a gadget spec in an XML file, and et, et cetera, uh, eventually that gets rendered into HTML and gets put out by the social network. So they can really uh, control what uh, content they deliver. And then second of all is that social networks uh, usually will have better infrastructure uh, than your app. You know, they, they probably have servers around the globe that they can use to optimize uh, requests and uh, pages that are served to their users. Uh, so along that line, uh, Open Social offers a feature called uh, a static content proxy. The idea is that a social network is willing to absorb some traffic for you, right? They're, they're actually willing to host some files on your behalf, and there's nothing you really need to do to sign up or use this except uh, rewrite one of, uh, some of your URLs to take advantage of this service. Um, some social networks uh, host these files on CDNs, which are content delivery networks. Basically, it's a set of distributed servers that are very heavily optimized for delivering static images and, and assets to your end users. So first of all, these servers are very close to your end users. And then when the user requests an image or, or a flash file or whatever, 
uh, it actually goes to a server that, that's closest to it, and then the, the latency is much quicker. Um, this is really important when your home servers are like centrally located. So for example, if you're running a server here in San Francisco and you have a lot of users in Brazil and India, instead of coming all the way to your server to get data, they can actually go to a CDN or, or whatever in India and uh, the experience is vastly improved for most of those users. And the simple call to, to do this inside of a gadget is to call gadgetsio.getproxy URL. And that will just basically take whatever uh, URL you give it and uh, put it on this static content host. Naturally, you want to keep in mind, though, that anything that's hosted on this way is, is not going to touch your server or anything. So um, it, it'll be hit the first time it's requested, but then after that, it'll probably effectively be cached for a long time. So only put stuff that, that really can, doesn't need to be dynamically modified on each page render. Uh, secondly, the, the social network controls what HTML it out, uh, outputs to the browser. So that means that even though you say that there needs to be an image file here and a JavaScript file there and CSS there, uh, they can actually make some optimizations that uh, will improve the, the speed of your gadget uh, without you even really needing to be aware of certain uh, optimizations. For example, one thing that they'll do is concatenate JavaScript files, so like Chris mentioned. Um, another thing they'll do is run minification programs on the concatenated result. And then a third thing they'll do is uh, you know, rearrange elements in the page to make them uh, more optimal for the browser. So things like putting CSS at the top of the page so that uh, the browser gets it first and doesn't have to re-render after it gets additional CSS. Or putting JavaScript at the end of the page so that it executes after all the DOM is loaded and, and it just delivers a better, prefer uh, better experience. Sorry. Um, Naturally, this, can, this leads to a little bit of confusion for, uh, for app developers who all of a sudden find themselves on a, a container that's doing these kinds of optimizations. So say there's an image that needs to be different every time the page is loaded or something. Uh, you can actually opt out of having certain URLs and tags uh, be rewritten. And this little snippet here just kind of shows how you can declaratively adjust this uh, rewriting. Uh, you have the option to include URLs that need to be rewritten. You can have the option to exclude URLs. And it'll take a glob pattern, so you can just kind of define a pattern that, that should be rewritten or it should not be. Uh, keeping in, in the vein of things that you can do as an open social application developer that you can't do as a website developer, uh, there's a whole bunch of features uh, that, are, that uh, open social kind of gives you. And the reason uh, it gives you these is uh, certain optimizations only make sense when you're running a social app. Uh, and so when the open social spec was created, uh, a lot of uh, conveniences and functionality was put in just with the, the thought that, hey, we're going to have a lot of users running apps that have millions and millions of users uh, accessing them. So uh, we'll make it easier for developers at that scale. Uh, one thing that I'd like to point out is that when you examine the open social API, a lot of it seems like it's a little bit uh, possibly confusing or whatever, but a lot of the decisions were made for the scaling reasons. And so when you're designing your own APIs, like we did with Quarter Mile, uh, we actually took advantage of some of these and, and kind of mimicked what uh, was going on. For example, um, we took advantage of batching. So the idea is that you want to minimize HTTP requests. So uh, whenever you're doing a social call, um, if you do it incorrectly, then you, it'll be causing one HTTP request each time you make the call. So the first example here is actually four lines of code that sends four HTTP requests. Um, that's not optimal at all. Uh, it's actually, it, there's a whole lot of reasons why this will be bad, but um, basically uh, what you can do to alleviate this is do as much as you can in a single trip. So you make a batch uh, operation and you add requests to it and then you execute uh, the batch. And then that sends all of the requests together in one payload. The server processes it all at, all at once on its back end and then sends you back all of the responses at the same time. You're only really waiting for one request to process. And using this approach, we actually designed the quarter mile API to take advantage of batching two. So where we were making two open social requests, we made one. And then when we made four a quarter mile API requests, we made one request also. Um, this had the net effect uh, that you'll see here. Uh, it's actually uh, kind of interesting because we didn't really see what we were expecting to see when we made these uh, batching optimizations. One thing was uh, latency actually, on average, did increase very slightly, like by 13 milliseconds, which is uh, certainly not uh, perceptible to the end user, but um, it's also not the greatest benefit that we were expecting. And um, possibly part of the reason we saw this was 
uh, because we were testing too close to our own servers. You know, it didn't really make that much of a difference. Now, if you're actually located in a position where making HTTP requests to, to a server is actually very costly, for example, if you're in a, a country that's several, you know, further away from the servers, uh, where India, like, for example, if you were in India and you were hitting our servers here in San Francisco, um, you might actually see that uh, number like increase, or you might see a better benefit from batching, but we actually didn't see it here. We did manage to improve requests, so we dropped two requests out, um, actually, uh, yeah, I guess, uh, and we improved the YSLO score uh, by two, two points. Um, the biggest change that we actually saw was actually uh, the CPU time drops, um, mostly because the, it, apparently the App Engine backend had a bit of an overhead for establishing a connection, and maybe it's the way that we wrote the APIs, but uh, doing m many operations in one loop as opposed to setting up a new HTTP connection, et cetera, um, wound up uh, saving just a little bit of CPU time. So we actually saved $36 a month this way. Um, Chris, yes, sir. So with all these optimizations in place, we're seeing that the application is still making a lot of requests. An open social application gets requested by the social network side to be rendered, that's step one. It will send the result back. It then will make a request to the social network side saying, hey, can you fetch some information from my data server? It processes that, sends it back to the social networking side, which then gets delivered to the gadget. So that's six steps of sending information to and fro before you actually have a fully rendered gadget. So how do we improve on that? One of the really cool new features, one of my favorites from the new 0.9 open social specification, is proxied content. Proxy content is a way for you to be able to say, I've got a gadget, but the content of it should come directly from my server. I don't want to write it in JavaScript. And one of the big benefits is that it requires a lot less da data being posted around and exchanged between all the different parties. So we went from six different actions up to four. So your server generates all the HTML based on the social information that's being posted to it. That's called the data pipelining part of the specification. And there's actually a preview version of it available on the sandboxes from iGoogle and Orchid. So how would you go about using this? Well, this would be your gadget XML spell, where you define, hey, I've got a content section, and this is the URL where I want you to, to fetch the HTML for my gadget. And the part that you see inside of the context section, those are the data pipelining tags. Now, we've got a lot of documentation on our wiki.opensocial site where you can find out what tags are available and how you can use them and in what ways they can be abused to do all kinds of really cool tricks with them. And then on your server side of things where you generate the HTML, you would receive the raw post, which is basically a JSON blob that contains all the social information that's being posted to your server that you requested. So you can decode that, and then you can just use it in your favorite scripting language. In this case, I'm using PHP, but you could do this in any language that can decode a JSON string. So this way, you can actually program something in your favorite environment, in your favorite language, and it's going to be really fast and efficient as well. When we applied this technique to Quartermau, we saw some really substantial savings. As you can see, the, ga the gadget latency went down from 2,700 milliseconds to just over 1,000 milliseconds. So it's incredibly fast and efficient. Even the total page loading time went down by quite a substantial number. The amount of requests we're making went down by quite a bit, from 26 to 20. And the y slow score shot up by four points as well. So the total monthly saving you would ma be making here is about $320 when applied to Quartermau. So one of the problems you're going to run into, one of the challenges, I should say, is that the social network site will be caching the result of the HTML that you generated. And it will store it based on both the user ID and the application URL. So what happens when your data changes? For instance, somebody posts an activity in quarter mile. How do you tell the social networking site to download that information again so that you can generate the latest information and send it to the social networking site? That's what the invalidation pattern is for. The invalidation pattern is a new social endpoint where you tell it, I've got a URL here, and for this user, I want you to throw away all the cached information and refetch it from my server. One of the things that I wanted to note is that a lot of people have asked, so how does it know what application this applies to? Well, you're using OAuth to sign the request to the server, and the OAuth consumer key is associated with your application. So that's how it figures out what the application ID is. So how would you go about using this? You make a post to the invalidate URL. 
you tell it, hey, I've got a JSON blob here, and in the JSON blob, you've got the keys that you want to invalidate. That's the invalidation keys. Now, these keys can be anything like a URL of your gadget spec. It can be a message bundle. Uh, it can be a user ID as well. And when you're posting a user ID, you're telling it, flush everything from your cache, which is related to my application and this user. So it will completely clear out everything. One of the other challenges you're gonna run into when you're building a social application that you're hoping is gonna be very popular is how to make your database scale. Database scaling is really important because when you're dealing with social information, you're gonna end up having tens of millions of users if you're really lucky. So just doing a plain query saying, well, I want you to match up all my friend lists and match it up against activities is not gonna be possible in a normal database anymore because there's gonna be too much information stored in it. So one of the things that I wanted to suggest is that if you're actually building the application now, you're starting building it, think about scaling. Think about things like a master-slave architecture where you've got one database that you're doing your writes to, and you've got a number of slave nodes connected to it where you're doing your reads from. That way you can use a lot more servers to make for a faster database. And that will get you quite a bit of runway before you run out of capacity. However, at some point replication is not gonna be efficient anymore because there's gonna be IO contention, there's gonna be so much replication happening that your servers are gonna be spending all their time on replicating and not on providing data to your application. So the next thing to think about is database partitioning. Now database partitioning is something that you can do in a lot of ways. You can say I'm gonna put my user table in one database set and I'm gonna put my activities table in another database set, that's step one. But after a while, you need to partition out those things as well and say, well, everything from user ID zero to a million, I'm gonna put in one set of databases, and everything from user ID one million to two million, I'm gonna put in another set of databases, et cetera, et cetera. And this should give you a lot of runway and a lot of scalability, and the good news is that if you are building on an app engine like we did with Quatermo, all of this will have already been figured out for you, and Google's provided all this functionality already in Bigtail, so you don't have to worry too much about the scalability issues. The other thing that does apply for App Engine users as well is to use memcache a lot. Cache everything that you can. So when you're generating something from a database that's gonna be used more often, like a list of activities or a list of friends, get it out of the database and then store it in your, in your data cache. That way, the next time that you need that list, you can just retrieve it from memory without having to do an expensive query, and that's gonna be quite an optimization. Another thing that I wanted to mention is that when you are using those kind of caching techniques, there might be situations where, you, for instance, you're looking for a username starting with an A in a friend list. So what you do is you retrieve the entire friend list from cache, which is an efficient way of storing it there, and then filter it in the software instead of actually doing another caching set because then you're gonna run out of memory, and that's gonna be costly in large scale. So software filtering might feel unnatural when you're used to databases, but when you're dealing with large-scale applications, it becomes almost a necessity. Uh, the last trick is by storing information in JSON blobs, and this is something that sites like Flickr, but also applications like iLike are doing. When you have a large list of pictures, of movies, or music files, or whatever, Joining up those tables becomes very expensive. Then you'd be talking about things like row overhead and integer matchings. And so what you can do is you take this playlist and instead of storing it in a standard database fashion with IDs that are relational to each other, you just store a JSON blob structure in a database in a single entry with the entire playlist in it. This way you don't have to do your relational matching and things are gonna be a lot quicker. One of the other ways of dealing with lots of information is background processing. At some point, if people have hundreds of thousands of friends, it's just not gonna be efficient anymore to go to your database and query it for, hey, did my million friends do something in the last 24 hours? So instead, what you could do is use background processing. Background processing means you store something in a queue saying, hey, there's been an activity and another process on another server will pick that up and slowly process through all those activities, creating the end results for you. And those end results are actually stored in the database or in your caching server. And the front-end application just reads those results in without actually calculating them. The good thing is that this way you can prioritize it, you can use different servers for it, uh, you can say, well, this is a really important activity that I need you to do right now while other things are okay to be delayed. So this gives you a lot of design flexibility to make a high volume data situation. 
Another benefit is that it doesn't block user interaction. If we enter something in quarter mouse saying, I ran for two miles yesterday, you don't want the whole user interface for freeze, to freeze for 10 seconds whilst updating all those activity tables. So by putting this in the background and putting it in a different system, you're not blocking your end users either. The only downside is that users see updates a little bit later because you're waiting for the whole background process to pick it up and digest it into its system. So updates might be delayed by a few minutes. But again, that's definitely a price worth paying to be able to scale up to much larger data volumes. When you have your own server, there's a lot of off-the-shelf and open-source systems that can do this for you. Uh, you could also write your own script very easily in whatever scripting language you want to use. If you're an app engine, we are going to do background processes soonish. Until then, you can use a cron tab, for instance. In App Engine, you can create a cron.yaml file and tell it, well, I want you to process all, all activities every one minute. And that process can check your queue. And if there's something to digest, it can do its manipulation on it, store the result in the database. And you've got a queuing system even on a cron type solution. So um, I'd actually like to bring that in and then talk about uh, when we were designing Quarter Mile, we actually had a planning session that sat down and kind of thought, well, how do we structure a data store uh, on App Engine for a social application? Uh, one of the first tenets that we kind of came up with uh, for how, or like what we really wanted to adhere to was to prefer to enforce hard limits up front than deliver a poor user experience. Basically saying that if we have to limit it, uh, limit certain users uh, in order to make everyone's experience consistent and good, uh, we're willing to do that. Uh, also, one of the first decisions that we made was that friend joins were very expensive, right? Uh, we looked at the numbers for Orkut, and Orkut lets you have 1,000 friends. Now, joining in 1,000 records may be possible. Uh, it's more difficult on App Engine than, say, MySQL. Uh, but then we looked at MySpace, and you can have hundreds of thousands or, or you know, even a million friends on MySpace. So uh, basically, uh, we said, no, that we can't just arbitrarily share data with every single person, uh, every single friend of a user. Um, Thankfully, we were working on a fitness application. You know, we came up with that fairly early and said, uh, do all 100,000 of my friends really need to see that I did 10 push-ups yesterday? I, at least, do they need to see it right away, the second that I put it into the system? So uh, we said no and decided, hey, maybe there's like a team of people that uh, you'd prefer to work out with. So um, certainly, like drawing from my own experiences, sometimes there's a certain people you want to tell, hey, I just went out for a, a seven-mile run. But I don't want to tell everyone, not right away at least. So we had this team system. Uh, we basically said that when you first use the app, you have to either pick a team or join a team. And then you can invite your friends to, to you know, have them join your team as well. And you saw that with the video that I demoed earlier. Uh, the side effect of the team system is that because you have to invite someone to your team, you're also implicitly inviting them to use the application. So there's actually more growth potential here, too. Um, so then we started writing down what were the goals for performance, right? Uh, we were using App Engine, so we decided that we wanted to fetch uh, all of the team's data for a given week in one database query, right? Because there's limits on App Engine. You can only uh, return 1,000 results max, so that was a nice limit that we had to work with. If you were using MySQL, maybe you would restructure this uh, goal in a different way. Maybe you'd say uh, the, the query to get uh, all of the team's data for a given week has to return a certain, number of, a certain amount of time, for example. So the question is, how many users can we put on a team knowing that we have 1,000 results? And it's a pretty simple calculation, right? We have 1,000 entries uh, return max. Uh, we are storing one workout per entry or one entry per workout. And we figured that if you're working out three times a day, that's about 20 updates a week, uh, you know, 21 really. But, and then uh, if you're working out more than three times a day, then you're probably not like, having enough time to do all the social application stuff that you're doing anyway. So fair enough. Uh, we, we know our audience. Um, 1,000 results divided by 20 updates a week uh, means you can have 50 users a team. And then uh, when we do this query, we can be guaranteed that in a single data store fetch, we can return all the results that we need to show for a single view. Uh, obviously, not every app can, can have this sort of limitation on, uh, imposed on itself. So uh, we did hypothetically uh, do the, implement the updates from your friends. You know, we wanted to say, how, how can we show what our friends have been uh, working on? Um, certainly, this is a very slow query, uh, slower uh, depending on the number of friends that you have. 
so what you basically have to do is, is use the open social REST APIs, fetch it from App Engine, fetch all of the user's friends from App Engine, see which ones were updated recently, then sort the whole list, and then uh, return that to the end user. Uh, even if you're displaying only uh, you know, the last 10 updates, you still have to do this for the entire list just to be sure that you have the data there. So um, what we did was, uh, again, using cron, uh, process this kind of information in the background of App Engine, um, doing the fetch, doing the up calculation, and then we decided that, hey, uh, following Chris's advice, we're, we're going to store the results of this calculation kind of in a big blob. But uh, we, we had a few options on, on where to put it. We could have uh, put it in the data store again, and just it would have been one fetch to, to return this whole friends calculation. Uh, we could have put it in memcache. It would have been even faster. It would have been hosted in RAM. But we didn't even really want the overhead of one HTTP uh, fetch, so we actually decided to use open social app data as a place to store it. Now, I love app data. Uh, I think app data is one of the most uh, misunderstood and misused portions of the open social specification. Um, certainly, I have a quote to back that up because it's right there. Um, but to be... <laughs> Uh, to, to be fair, uh, it's, it's very fast. Uh, there's, no, um, there's no fetch from the gadget to your application when you're using app data as a store for data. Uh, that's because it's hosted on the container side, and the container injects it into the gadget when it gets rendered. So uh, people misuse it because they expect it to work like a normal data store that you'd have locally on your own server. Uh, it's, uh, they want to put secrets in there. They want to, you know, store passwords or, or credentials. Uh, they also want to store things like top scores for, for the entire app. And, you know, oh, I, I want to put all my uh, data that can't be modified in there. And to be fair, uh, it's not really designed for that. It's public, so anyone can see it. So if you put a password in there, they can see your password as well. Uh, it's also user-writable via JavaScript. So even if you only code in certain uh, practices into the JavaScript of your gadget, if you're using JavaScript to, to write it to the app, uh, app data on the container, then uh, the end user can modify that in Firebug and put in whatever they want. So if you're storing something like a top score, uh, that's arbitrarily changeable. But it's, what it's really good for is storing this kind of rendered bulk data as a cache because what it, it's injected directly into the page when the page is first loaded, and then you can just call it and dump it into a div element. So if you want to store HTML in there, it's, it's a very, very quick write to, to display that HTML. There's almost no overhead, um, essentially, when you're doing that. Um, talking about uh, different strategies and limitations, uh, there's certain optimizations that will be forced upon you. And, and really, if you think about it, there's uh, certain things as an app developer that I'm sure you'd love to do, and the container's just not going to have any of it and not going to let you do anything. Uh, certainly, quarter mile is a great example of this, so that the naive implementation uh, made a few performance mistakes. We, we've already cut down the performance by quite a bit. Uh, the container, like we were talking about before, has a vested interest in keeping the gadgets that it's hosting fast. Uh, obviously, the user uh, sees the, the overall performance of the container, um, and even if, the, if a certain gadget is slowing that down, then uh, the, perf the perception is that the container is slow. And uh, so containers might start uh, influencing or implementing constraints to keep users honest. Uh, we actually had two containers that uh, we ran into uh, uh, challenges with, or maybe not challenges, but just we had to be aware of, of uh, limitations. So, for example, uh, the iGoogle iGoogle is soon to be instating a latency uh, policy on their gadgets. Uh, basically, that when you have a gadget that's running in iGoogle in the directory, uh, there will be a little marker next to it in the directory saying, this app is, uh, might slow down your iGoogle experience. Uh, it makes sense, right? Uh, like, iGoogle wants to be very fast. And, and as a great illustration of this, um, I'm going to show you a video about an iGoogle page load. You'll also see through the course of this video that there's kind of like an implicit latency penalty anyway. And uh, to basically start that off, um, I hope that will play. OK. So here I am clicking over to one of my new tabs in iGoogle. And keep in mind, what do you see first when the gadgets start loading? Obviously, there's weather. Uh, then next, there's the Flickster app. Uh, then there's the Wall Street Journal and then New York Times. And then those last two apps aren't even on my radar. By now, I've already picked what I want to work with. Uh, maybe I want to go see a movie. 
Uh, maybe I want to go check the weather. But my attention is not focused on the two slowest apps. Um, obviously, this, this video is slowed down a little bit. I actually expanded it by, uh, by twice as well. It's about half as fast as it would be normally. Um, but you can see that uh, when you're in a profile of context, that you're competing against the other gadgets that are rendering for the end user's uh, views, right? Uh, if they're not focused on your app and they're focused on something else, they're not going to engage with your application as much. You're not going to see as much growth. So uh, talking about like kind of these profile or canvas view, or these profile pages or, or these home page sort of views uh, is basically uh, that you have a lot of gadgets together, smushed together. And these are frequently some of the most highly trafficked portions of the site that they're running on. For example, the iGoogle page is, is, or is people's home page you know, for their entire browser. So uh, that, that's a huge amount of traffic right there. Uh, also, for Orchid, uh, profiles is like one of the biggest portions of the or Orchid site. Uh, users love uh, putting gadgets on their profiles. It's kind of like a, an expression, a way to sort of say who they are. Uh, and so they put a lot of different gadgets on them. And it does affect the overall performance of the profile page on Orkut. So uh, Orkut wound up actually turning off uh, profile renders because of um, latency and uh, security issues, right? They didn't want dynamic code executing. Uh, thankfully, they turned them recently back on uh, with a new Open Social 0.9 feature called Templates. Uh, basically, templates is a way that you can declare what data your application needs, and you can render in a declarative way as well. So there's no actual JavaScript being executed, even though templating looks very similar to JavaScript. Um, you can display social data, data about your friends. You can display app data. So if you're using the cache, that's a great use for it. Uh, you can't use external fetches or dynamic uh, data fetches. Um, here's an example of what a, a profile render in a template might look like. Uh, you'll see I'm requiring two features, uh, open social dash data and open social dash template. So that's the division here. You, first of all, you say what data you need, and then the second is how am I going to show it? And uh, you'll notice that when I'm including the templates, I'm adding an extra uh, optional parameter called process on server. And that basically says this template should be parsed by the server, don't execute any of it client side, strip out any JavaScript, whatever. Uh, and that's more of a, a security thing. Uh, somewhat of a performance thing, too, because that, that rendered output can be cached by the container. Uh, so the blue, uh, the blue little snippet at the top is a people request for the friends of the viewer. And then the green at the bottom is a repeating uh, div that repeats on each friend and outputs their, their name. You'll, you'll notice that it's actually very similar to the PHP sample that Chris posted for the proxy content example. So. Uh, We've talked a lot about a lot of different uh, optimizations, and I kind of want to bring everything back together and uh, kind of give you that high-level overview one more time. Uh, basically, we had three different types of metrics that we were measuring on. Uh, and we found different approaches uh, affected different one, uh, each one differently. So for example, if we wanted to reduce app size, we used uh, JavaScript minification, content rewriting, uh, used, the dynamic, or used the static content proxy. Um, data pipelining was a great benefit for our gadget. Um, and then invalidation and, and setting our cache headers correctly also affected the app size, the download size, the bandwidth that was used. Um, note that some of these are in blue. Uh, those are the ones that are in aggregate are, are beneficial over many uh, views. They're not, so they're not going to affect the, a single app render. And that's why we don't have real like, metrics, because this is going to vary from app to app. Uh, the benefit can be really huge, though. You know, if you're caching static content, then you can probably see like 90% reduction in traffic. Uh, if you're caching dynamic content, depending on the caching that you're doing, you'll see less than that, but it'll still be a significant gain. So think about all the numbers that we have in this presentation, and you can go and look online later afterwards. Um, but it, adjusting caching can have uh, you know, a tens of percent points, percentage points uh, impact on those numbers as well. Uh, reducing the number of requests was improved by JavaScript minification, spriting, um, content rewriting, because it kind of did those automatically for us, and uh, setting our cache headers. Again, cache headers in aggregate, fewer requests over time. Finally, latency. Uh, basically, JavaScript minification, spriting, rewriting, proxy, batching, optimizing the data store. Everything we did, um, actually, I'm sorry, uh, batching should not be in that <laughs> list. Um, everything but batching seemed to have an impact on latency. Um, batching probably should. We just didn't see it in, in the numbers. Uh, keeping that in mind, we kind of took everything together, and we, we tried to use as many optimizations as, to get, as possible. And we have uh, what's considered the most optimized implementation. Uh, 
um, the net gain. Uh, obviously, we saved uh, 1.6 seconds off of each page render of our gadget. Um, from the, the gadget's point of view, we saved uh, about uh, 0.6 seconds. From, from the end user's point of view, we saved 20 HTTP requests, and we improved our y, uh, y slow score by 17 points to a respectable 89. Um, I'm sure we could have pushed it more, uh, but these changes are, are already like fairly significant. We saved $325 off of our monthly uh, costs, assuming that we were a fairly heavily trafficked app. Um, so keeping in mind that you know, like the, the, the cost might not be staggering, but when you can shave uh, you know, 0.6 seconds off of your gadget's rendering time, uh, what does that mean in terms of usage and adoption for your gadget as well? Uh, we saw a direct correlation on high-level sites like um, Amazon and Google between latency and user adoption. So uh, being able to improve by this vast margin uh, means significant impact for your application. And uh, because we're actually running very close on time, um, if there's any quick questions, uh, I don't think I set this up in time. So I'm going to check moderator uh, and see if anything. But if anyone wants to come up and ask us questions for the next three minutes, uh, be, that'd be great. So we only have three minutes at the moment, but we also have to open social office hours just down the hallway here. So if there's anything else that we can't cover in the next three minutes, that'll be a great place to look us up. Cheers. So anyone, questions? I think we're saving it for the office hours. Cool. cool. Right, see Thank you there, guys. You.